This was the first Legacy of Kane game that I ever played back in the day on the Sega Dreamcast. I remember playing the game a fair bit back then with all its puzzles. Legacy of Kane Soul Reaver is the second entry to the franchise with its dark and gothic setting and the return to land of Nosgoth. I found the story to be an interesting one, following along the events from Blood Omen where Kane refused to sacrifice himself and a lot of time has passed since that game. This time around the main protagonist is Raziel, one of Kane's top lieutenants and firstborn son of Kane, and Kane is now king of all the vampires and their clans and conqueror of Nosgoth. In short, Kane kills Raziel because he evolves faster than Kane and surpasses him, so out of jealousy Kane executes Raziel by throwing him into the abyss. Where water is like acid to vampires is one of the most painful deaths that vamps can be inflicted with and in that time hundreds of years pass and then this giant squid says he brought Raziel back from the dead so he can kill Kane. There was only one possible outcome. My eternal damnation. I, Razio, was to suffer the fate of traitors and whooplings, to burn forever in the bowels of the Lake of the Dead. Cast him in. <laughs> Burning with white hot fire, I plunged into the depths of the abyss. Unspeakable pain, relentless agony. Time ceased to exist. Only this torture and a deepening hatred of the hypocrisy that damned me to this hell. An eternity passed, and my torment receded bringing me back from the precipice of madness. The descent had destroyed me, and yet I lived. Yet not as a vampire, but a rape. So Raziel sets off on his journey of vengeance against his brothers and Cain, who threw him into the abyss. And in that time that Raziel has been gone, he finds out that the land of Noskov is in further state of decay when he last saw it. Soul Reaver is a third person view platformer most of the time, and I discovered that the combat is basic and simple to get into. Also, Raziel can glide and high jump. I thought that the tutorial was nice and sweet, it did not overstay its welcome, it paced it out just right for me. And how the puzzles work? You can switch between the physical realm and the spectral realm at any time. The spectral realm is twisted to the material realm and is one of the key game mechanics. To solve this puzzle between the spirit realm and the physical world, nevertheless, in the spectral realm, Raziel can't interact with objects. Although, to go back to the physical realm, you need to use these conduits and have a full set of health. I did enjoy that the game didn't overwhelm me with its puzzles. It starts off easy, then as I progress it got more and more complicated as I went throughout the game. However, I've got to say that this game does love its cute puzzles. There's so many of them, I lost count. But that's not saying that I didn't have fun solving these puzzles, where I had to move, flip and twist the blocks into the right position to match the mural on the wall, or to get the pipe working again with the block pipe puzzles or stacking the blocks so I can make a jump. I found it easy to overstep when platform jumping on some parts of the game. Just like before the boss fight, it had me jumping on these circle pillars to get to the top and switch back into the physical realm. This is where I learned climbing these pillows is one of the hardest things that I had to do in the whole entire game for me. It must have took me like 10 attempts just to climb this and a lot of swearing. Yet this could be down to my controller. It's just something to be aware of. I would like to know if anyone else had this problem when platform jumping. Raziel's health drains over time to encourage you to feed by killing enemies and devouring their souls in the physical world or in the spectral one. If you run out of health, you go back to the spirit world and if you run out in the spirit world, you go back to the start of the game. But all your progress will stay the same where Raz can't really die in this game. What made a decent change of pace for me. 
you can pick up weapons that you find throughout Nodscop, and this is how you kill certain enemies in certain ways, like vampires, you've got to kill them by impaling them, and if you do not consume their soul, when you pick up the weapon again, they will get back up. It urged me to feed on their souls more often to keep them permanently down, and their body disappears after consuming their soul, and Raziel can set them on fire and use the environments to destroy other vampires. There is a good amount of enemy variety, especially on the vampire side. Each clan of vampires have different vamps that evolve into monsters or de-evolve, when most of them can't speak and just seem to go on animal instinct alone now. Like the insect vamps in the tower, what don't seem to have much thought going on apart from eat and cocoon human, but gets off an arachnid type of vibe. Then there's a cobra vamps from the other clan of vampires, what can swim and submerge underwater and spit at you. Then there's the bat like ones, what does talk to you and have some intelligence. Heretic, you shall not pass. Such loyalty to one who has you guarding this outpost like a chained dog. Do you prosper on the scraps he casts you? Your insults will do nothing to blunt the agonies of your demise. Cain killed me once. Behold the result. I have no more to fear from you. And then there's the humans. Depending on the decision, what you may not know about is if you kill the first human you see, the other humans will become hostile to you. Except if you don't kill any humans, they kind of see you as a deity or something as they drop to their knees and worship Raziel. Unfortunately, I wasn't aware of this and killed every human, so they all tried to kill me. Nevertheless, I like that the game gave me a choice here that I wasn't aware of. The average enemy AI is okay, I wouldn't call them brilliant, but they do work. It's probably down to the limitations of the time, because after about 30 seconds or so, you've seen everything what that type of enemy can do, and it becomes very predictable. And after a while, the enemies do seem to respawn, like when I fell off a ledge and I had to go through some of the stage again, they respawned exactly at the same spots. Each boss fight is unique to the other, and how gruesome that Rabbit and Yell's brothers have become over the hundreds of years, and the design on them are brilliant. And the last time I saw them, was that the game's intro? It's like, how did they start from that and ended up like this? And the game does have a good explanation for this. Over time, vampires evolve. It's why Kane looks so different in this game compared to Blood Omen. Merely, Raziel's brothers have kind of fallen off the deep end when it comes to evolving. And defeating them is something else. You can't go toe to toe with these guys. They're way stronger than Raziel, so you end up using the surroundings to help you out. Such as the first boss fight, it can go through fences and gates, so I had to jump over the wall and lure him to the gate where I dropped an impaling gate on top of him. I had to do this twice, and then it shows a ceiling grinder. So I'm like, okay, I've got to lure him to there now and activate it. And all I could think about after this fight was how fun it was figuring out what I had to do. And then later on, I got to the top of this tower, and now I'm fighting a mutated mantis where I set his eggs on fire and throw it back at it. <laughs> and after that, I just look forward to the next boss fight. By how unique they are, and after defeating a boss, Raziel unlocks a new ability like climbing walls, being able to swim, and going through gates in the spirit world. Consuming Zephon's apostate soul has bestowed on you a new gift. Like his vampire spawn, you are able to scale certain walls which are otherwise impassable, but only in the physical realm. In the spirit world, these insubstantial edifices will not support you. And this unlocked new paths throughout Noskos with the abilities that I unlocked by defeating these bosses so I can get to the next area of the game, what I could not access before. There is so much optional side content that you can miss, like the magic puzzles that are optional, where Raziel can unlock new spells by finding and doing puzzles, and my favourite one's got to be the lighthouse puzzle, where I unlock the bright sunblast that just instantly killed any vampires that surrounded me. Finishing that puzzle was well worth it in my opinion. 
and how the lighthouse seems to stand out to me and activating it so I can get the sunblast was really cool to me. I'm sorry, I don't actually really know the names of these magic abilities. And I loved how the game rewarded me for exploring where I discovered new upgrades for Raziel as well. Where I find these triangle artifacts. It takes like five to get an upgrade help bar spiral. But it's also fine now to get them as well, where some are trickier than others where you have to do a puzzle to get them. There is also magic artifacts to find and collect that increase magic duration with the numbers that are in the corner of the screen. And unlocking that Reaver Blade after the fight with Kane, what you get by progressing throughout the story, I had some fun with this where I could shoot it like a gun or wave it in fire later on. So I could fire fireballs to set the enemy alight, and that fire reaver is also optional to unlock. You don't have to get it to finish the game, although you'd be missing out on all the fun I had with it. That fire reaver is just... <laughs> although there is a downside, Raziel must have full health in the physical realm to use it. One hit and it disappears until you have full HP again. Yet Raziel can use this in the spirit realm regardless of his strength. Soul Reaver is a semi-open world between the two realms, and the rest of the map unlocks as you get new abilities. I thought some of the level design is amazing with its gothic atmosphere, like the water area, what well, seems like it's a sunken city, or climbing to the top of the tower with the cobwebs everywhere with the vampire insect. As I uncovered each section of Noskov that I visit, it had its own decay and feel to it, and I learned that this is what the game excels at, is that I never found it a dull moment, although there is a bit of backtracking if you want to unlock everything for Raziel. There are fast travel doorways with glyphs on them, what Raziel can walk through once activated. The only issue is what I had with this is remembering the glyphs that show to the area of the map where I wanted to go. I've got this wrong a couple of times. Because there's no map menu when the original legacy of Kane Blood Omen had it. So this is a design choice what just baffles me that it wasn't included. Except I was surprised that there are no load screens, not a one. When I loaded into the game, not one load screen whatsoever. And that is something what this game did really well. I have no idea how the developers pulled this off, especially on the PS1 version, and this shows how much they cared about this game. And I appreciated the hell out of it, where it kept me immersed in this world. The game does run on a manual save system, so my advice here is to save often. However, when you reload back into the game, you are back at meeting that squid bit of the squid area. But don't worry, everything you've done is still there, and all your progress throughout the game is safe. It's just that you will always be at the start of this point when loading into the game like if you died. That's where the fast travel doorways come into place as well. There are moments where I was like, what do I do now? But lucky enough that the squid does tell me back in his lair on his platform what to do next. I think that the cutscenes are nicely done and for characters, I think that Raziel and Kane stand out the most to me because Kane seemed to be up to something throughout the whole game and Raziel the race with his monologue what keeps going on through each section of the game. I swore I saw a glint of satisfaction in Kane's eye when the Soul Weaver was destroyed. I did not understand the game that Kane was playing, but I knew the finishing move. Oh, that squid who guides Raziel. I found the other characters to be very interesting, even the other lieutenants of Kane's armies, Raziel's brothers in arms, I think or it's his actual brothers, it's just never actually established in the game, had exceptional voice acting. It shows how ambitious the title was at the time. I think that the graphics have improved a lot from the PS1 version, where this is a port from that. Nevertheless, not all models have been upgraded from the PS1 port. The ones that I noticed was Raziel's model is approved upon and how the game seemed to be very smooth where I think that it's running at a higher frame rate. The gameplay animation is alright on the Dreamcast, it's that everything seems to have a default pose all the time, as in most cutscenes, yet this is probably down to the limitations of the time and probably where it was on the PS1 first. 
And I think that the animation shine the most is when I encounter the enemies, they all seem to move different from each type of enemy. I think that the soundtrack is good and sums up that gothic atmosphere of Nosco. But that main theme is something else. Every time when that came on, I got drawn into the game even more. It's kind of like indescribable to me. It's like, yeah, I'm ready to play Soul Reaver. <laughs> along the game is it took me around about nine hours although I was exploring a lot of the time and getting the upgrades for Raziel however I could see that this game done in about six or seven hours ish so in the end I had a blast returning to this game so have you played Soul Reaver what do you think of it leave it in the comments below until next game I'm off <laughs>